All right, let's go on the record. We'll have Dr. Jamison joining us in a few minutes. <clears throat> but um, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange that's been properly noticed for today, Thursday, February 12th at 1 p.m. And we're meeting in our Carson City office and teleconferencing down here in our Henderson uh, office. And before we get started, let's test the microphone, make sure that we've had it at, at the proper uh, volume. So Damon, would you say a few words just so we can test the volume? Thank you for having me here today. Can you do Louder. that just a little bit more? Uh, can you hear me now? How is it, How do I sound right now? You sound better if you stay close to the microphone, although we're getting some feedback. We're getting feedback. Are you? We will, uh, we will adjust as we present our reports accordingly. Our uh, IT officer has it under control. So as feedback comes, we'll make sure and, and adjust throughout the conversations. Okay. Well, it may be interference from uh, phones also, so we'll just watch it and see. Um, I want to welcome everybody here today, and I'll ask our executive director to take the role and make sure that we've got a quorum. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Smith Campbell. Here. Ms. Atkins. Here. Ms. Johnstone. Here. Ms. Lewis. Here. Dr. Jameson is on her way. Ms. Kerr. Here. Dr. Ford. Here. Mr. Gilliland. Commissioner Kipper. Here. Ms. Tesca. Here. And Chair, you have a quorum. All right, thank you. Mr. Gilbert, um, let's open it up now. Or do you have any announcements? Not at this time. Okay. I have one announcement. Oh, okay. Really, yeah, I do have one announcement. Um, I think as the, uh, Lynn Atkins, I'm uh, uh, Lynn Atkins, and I think as the chair announced last time that we would be having elections for her position. Um, and so we have a parting gift <laughs> on behalf of the board. <laughs> and we wanted to say thank you to you for all of the hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of hours that you put in over the course of what we all figured out was just the last four and a half years, but primarily probably 2014. I believe you had a second full-time job as the chair of the as the chair of this group, and we were all thankful every day that it wasn't us, um, <laughs> because none of us would have had the time um, to put into it, and you cared about it, you led us all down the right path, um, you let everyone be heard, you helped us transition back into a um, incredible um, functioning uh uh, exchange, which is what we had planned to do from the beginning, and we got a little, a little, a little detour, but um, we're back on track thanks to your leadership. So this is a small oh token from your board members to say thank you and hope that you remember us when you see this and that you look back fondly as your time on oh, board. Thank you. <laughs> when we take a break, I'm going to okay. open. Okay. okay. I don't want to wait till I have to go home tonight. <laughs> So I promise we'll take a break. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Well, and as you all know, I couldn't have done it without all of you and staff and all of our partners. So, And I will have a few words to that effect right before we have our election today. So, all right, let's, let's go to public comment. Do we have any public comment here in uh, Henderson? All right, how about public comment in Carson City? No. All right, thank you. This is Dr. Ford. Dr. Jameson just joined the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Um, all right, uh, the first or the third item on the agenda, but the first order of business today is the workshop and adoption hearing for the proposed amendment to the exchange regulations relating to the per member per month fees charged to insurers offering coverage on the exchange to change the fee basis from a fixed dollar amount to a percentage, making certain changes with respect to the notice of the adoption of such fees and making certain other changes with respect thereto. So um, who is going to lead us on the workshop today? I believe that Mr. Haycock was planning on doing that. All right, Mr. Haycock, do you want to take it, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Damon Haycock. And today we are going to discuss uh, the Regulation EX-04A, 
uh, should be attached in your handouts. Uh, it, a properly noticed and, and prepared workshop and adoption <laughs> hearing. And the the basis for this, as was mentioned in the agenda item, is to to clean up some of the language and propose a new methodology for how we establish those per member per month fees. So, so before we get into the report that supports this regulation, I just want to go over the basic changes. So on page one, uh, there is uh, there, the only change that we've corrected is instead of calling them standalone contracts of insurance, this is under section uh, section four, number one, part A. Uh, we've uh, wanted to utilize the same vernacular that, that we all use across the nation for standalone plans, and they're referred to as standalone dental plans. Uh, they're usually acronymed SADPs. And so that first process is just to, to clean up the language. The next uh, recommendation is, is how we have changed uh, Part C on uh, page 2 of 3, which that we would be determining the, the premium uh, or the premium fee as – by declaring a percentage for. And so, so subsection I, the percentage fee established each year will be equal to or less than the percentage fee established by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, or CMS, for all qualified health plans and standalone dental plans offered on the federally facilitated marketplace. And so this basically establishes a price or a fee ceiling that we are not to exceed to ensure that we are still uh, following the requirements and that we are, are affordable compared to our federal counterparts. Subsection 2, the percentage fee established will be applied to the pre-subsidized insurance carrier filed premiums. And, and I know you already went over the public comment section of the agenda today, but there was public comment submitted by Delta Dental that uh, where they where they were addressing this specific agenda item and I wanted to to talk a little bit about it uh, at this point because they request that the percentage of premium uh, be on the basis of the exact premium of the product itself not on an average premium and I think as uh, we can all agree that subsection 2 specifically alludes to that and so the percentage fee established will be applied to the pre-subsidized insurance carrier filed premiums and then we, uh, be, because of moving to this percentage, all of the math, all of the theory behind how we back into standalone dental plan costs and, and the, the formulas, uh, you'll see it was in that section three that we are, are removing, uh, as well as, as how we, we differentiate between the fees between standalone dental plans and qualified health plans without standalone dental plan or dental uh, benefits. So basically, the, the whole premise of this regulation and this process this is, is to simplify it, and then I'm going to go into some detail on the report. Hopefully, that will preclude any questions that you may have, and then I'll be more than willing to take them at the end. So there's, there's an attached report here. It's four pages. Adopting the 2016 per member per month fees is the title. And, and basically, we're, we're looking to revise the process as mentioned earlier. And so, so a little bit of, of history, our current process before today, uh, back on January 10, 2013, uh, you, the board, voted to set the per member per month fees charged to insurance carriers, of course, participating on our exchange. For this calendar year, 2000, or, or, or for calendar year 2014, was $4.95 and 36 cents uh, for standalone dental plans. And then the fee, that fee, just so we can start to compare apples and oranges, uh, was set at 1.73% of the 2011 average premiums and the standalone dental plan fees were calculated, right? Uh, we all recognize that we, we took a, a, a best guess as to what the fees should be and the requirements and the enrollments that were attached to them. And so regulation EX01A, and this starts on page two, that these were developed to meet those budgetary requirements that, that we had to guess, we, we weren't in operation yet, that included projected enrollment of 118,000 enrollees. So, of course, the initial enrollment period occurred, and as of April 10, 2014, you all came back together to vote and set the per member per month fees for this calendar year. And those were established at $13 for qualified health plans and $0.83 cents for standalone dental plans. And, and whether or not we, we express this uh, to, again, start to compare apples to apples, back in uh, 2014 when you adopted these fees for this year, the $13 per member per month fee uh, was equal to 3.43% 3 
of the 2014 average premiums and standalone dental plan fees, again, were calculated by backing into those as a proportion. But that 3.43% is going to be important as we continue through this report. So again, these fees were developed to meet those new budgetary requirements that we anticipated would exist for this calendar year right now. So here's our, our proposed process, right? Staff is proposing that we transition from charging a straight flat dollar fee to charging a percent of the pre-subsidized premiums. And again, to simplify the language that I went over earlier uh, in the actual regulation. So the, the exchange developed the fees for 2014 and 2015 from a percent of pre-subsidized premiums, and we calculated this into a dollar amount to charge each carrier. And so the process that we're proposing is the process we did in the background to, to come to that $13 per member per month last year anyway. This is just uh, formalizing this process and, and making it even more transparent so, again, we can compare apples to apples. So, so what are the benefits of this proposed process? To the exchange, we want to simplify the development of this fee each year. Uh, we want to better align with the majority of the exchanges across the nation. And so the federally facilitated marketplace, which, of course, is supporting 34 states directly, uh, they charge 3.5% of premium. And they have done so since, since they began. And they, they set that up, of course, uh, beginning for, in 2014. But not only does the federally facilitated marketplace utilize a percentage of premium, but so does other state-based marketplaces. So our counterparts in Oregon, they charge 3% of premium, uh, which is set on a sliding scale that can increase to 5% depending on their enrollment figures. Colorado charged 1.4% uh, of premium in 2015 and will increase this percentage as they have now found that percent to be unsustainable. <laughs> and Hawaii also charged just 2% of premium this year and will increase their percentage as they too have found that that initial assessment does not make them sustainable. But again, this illustrates that this idea of a percentage of premium isn't new. It, it is just something that we elected not to utilize in the first few years. So, so not only are we looking to benefit the insurance or, or the exchange, but we also want to make sure that we can make this process as simple as possible for our insurance carriers, our partners that will have to, to incorporate these into their premiums. So the current reporting and payment process. So right now, carriers are currently required to report enrollments to CMS on a monthly basis. And that in report itself is designed basically with a column in an Excel sheet that actually calculates 3.5% of those premiums. And so the federal government has set up a template that already applies a percentage of premium to their reporting mechanism. And then they, uh, they ask the carriers, of course, to pay that premium, uh, premium fee. And so, so to streamline the reporting, the exact same form submitted to CMS is provided to us and staff performs the calculations in-house uh, as to how to determine the application of our $13 today, right? And so what this would, would also be allowed to do is, uh, is to provide a simple change to the percentage from that 3.5% to, of course, today what we're proposing is, is 3%. But whatever you, you all vote on and choose today and in the future, this process actually simplifies reporting and invoicing and payment for the carriers. And, and so, so those are the benefits to, to the insurance carriers and to the exchange. But not only that, we wanted to make sure that, that we provided value to Nevadans, right? Everything we do here needs to provide that value. And so the benefit to, to Nevadans is that the fees that the exchange charges insurance carriers will now be more transparent and easily comparable with other states. So as mentioned earlier in the, in the benefits section here, as, as well as what the federally facilitated marketplace uses, every Nevadan will be able to compare two simple numbers. What do my insurance carriers pay the federally facilitated marketplace, and what am I going to pay the Silver State Health Insurance, or what are they going to pay the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange? And so there's a transparent comparison that, that is very simple and easy to determine value to Nevada. So as far as the adoption of these fees, and what does that 3% really look like on the next section on page 3? So, of course, the previous fee back on April 10, 2014, was established at $13.83 for standalone dental plans, respectively. And so what does that look like? Back, back when the fee was adopted, again, 3.43% of premium. And, and therefore, what, what would the feds have charged if we didn't exist? And that would have been $13.25, uh, which equates to 3.5% 
of those premiums uh, that occurred at the time that we established these fees. And so right off the gate, right out the bat, we are a quarter cheaper, right? I mean, that's the simple math of the process. As far as standalone dental plans, it, it was roughly the same based on how we proportionally backed into their fees. So 83 cents would have been about 83 cents to the feds as well. And so we didn't see an additional cost savings to Nevadans in standalone dental plans. So, so let's talk about the basis for, for setting that fee, right? It did uh, the, the proposed fees for qualified health plans that do not include dental insurance coverage are designed to cover expenses, right? Less our other revenues and create an operational reserve. We've mentioned this in all of our budget discussions. We're not a for-profit entity. We have, we have expenses, we have revenues, and we need a reserve to ensure continuous operations. And so that process has not changed since our inception. The pro, uh, proposed fees for qualified health plans that do include dental insurance coverage, of course, equal to the QHP fees plus the standalone dental plan. Fees. This is all in the basis of the original uh, regulation. So I'm going to move move forward to page four, where, where we really get into the, the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to do here. And so we're 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 recommending that we set the fee at two for 2016 at three percent of that pre-subsidized premium. And so to give you uh, some parameters and to see what it looks like today in the numbers that you're used to seeing. The average premium uh, that, uh, on the last report that we've received, and I want to add a caveat here, that that average premium changes. And it changes because people come onto and off of health insurance plans every month. People move, people have uh, dependents added, uh, their, spouses get dep or their spouses get employer, employer coverage. And so that average premium is a moving target. But we always have to pick a point in time so we can make a calculation and provide to you the best opportunity to determine these fees on a go-forward basis. So the average premium at this time right now is $405.81. So what does 3% of that premium look like? Well, $12.17. So right off the bat, you can see that, that it appears not only are we going to be half a point less than the feds, but we're also you know, reducing the dollar amount if you had to do a straight line dollar comparison as of today. Uh, and just, just to, to illustrate the situation even further, just to pound it home, right now the feds would charge 3.5%. And although back in 2014 we thought $13 was just under that, 3.5% of average premium right now for 2015 plans – is $14.20. So our $13 today is $1.20 less than what the feds would charge with, with the foresight that we provided you guys last year. So $12.17 is, is, is the equivalent of 3% of the average premium, which we believe is a drastic difference from the, the $13 or the 3.5% and the $14.20 that the feds would charge us today. And on those standalone dental plans, the average premium right now is $25.78. 3% of that is $0.77. Cents. Again, a reduction in, in what those fees would, uh, would have looked like from a straight line basis last year. And the feds would charge $0.90. Cents. So as you can see, there's an initial apples-to-apples -apples transparent comparison that shows cost savings to Nevadans based on cost savings to our insurance carriers. So... Many factors play a role in determining what fee we charge, of course, and, and we've gone over, I think, just about all of them. Uh, and and the, that main point, and I'm going to say it one more time, yeah, that the fee of 3% is well below that federally facilitated marketplace fee. And underneath, you can see a, a snapshot here on the last page of page four of the governor's recommended budget that we have submitted and honestly just testified to yesterday where we basically need uh, about $6.2 million and how this is going to uh, achieve those operational uh, expenses, revenues, and those reserves that are so critical to ensure we are sustainable and operational in the future. And, and with that, I'm willing to uh, answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Haycock. And I'm gonna open it up for questions among board members first, and then I'll open it up for public comment with questions or uh, statements by anyone that wants to participate in the workshop. So I'm going to open up for questions from any board members. It's Mr. Haycock. Dr. Jamison. Uh, well done projections last year. And um, on the $3, looking at our budget that we're projecting for this year, next year, um, how much does that end up giving us for like, Reserve. 
That's a very good question, Dr. Jameson. Damon Haycock, for the record. So currently, we are still receiving reports on what our final enrollment is going to look like just outside of open enrollment. And then, of course, as mentioned earlier, that enrollment can fluctuate. But right now, all, all of our sources are, are working towards a 90-day reserve. Uh, other states, state-based marketplaces have anywhere between a 90 and 180-day reserve. I know we initially wanted a 30-day reserve at the inception of the exchange, but seeing as how we no longer maintain the, the billing and remittance function, thank goodness, for the exchange, that uh, we don't see our funding first. And so a 90-day reserve we feel is very appropriate. And so all of our projections provide that level of reserves so, so we can ensure we meet our obligations. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? A second. Lynette Pins for the record. Um, I have a couple of questions. The average premium in 2015, um, Damon, that's $405. Is that pre-subsidized? Uh, yes, is it is. All, all discussions here are pre-subsidized dollars. And the last two years that we did this for the $13 and the $4.95, those were flat fees um, regardless of whether folks got a subsidy or not. Is that right? That is correct, Ms. Seconds. Okay. Um, and can you remind me, just back to basics, how does the consumer see this? Is this, is this amount built into the premium price, or does the consumer see it once they choose a plan, they see what the monthly premium, they see what their um, subsidy might be? Is there an add-on kind of like on the checkout receipt that they'll see this 3%, or is that something that's built into the price? Can someone remind me of how this looks to the consumer? So Damon Haycock, again, for the record, I can, I can answer that. The costs of our fees, whether they are flat fees or percentage fees, are built into the rate filings that are submitted for, for plan certification. So it, when you go online and see a, a $300 plan before or after subsidies, irregardless, we have uh, three or excuse me, regardless, we have uh, all the fees already built into it. And so there is no line item that says here's what, what the insurance carrier is being charged by the exchange and here's what, what the rest of that fee is. It's all built into their product. Do we have any other questions? I just have a <clears throat> clarification, Madam Chair. This is Leslie Johnstone. Damon, um, what you show as the governor budget on page four I assume you've converted this to a calendar year basis for the purpose of this agenda item because uh, it's slightly different than the budget report itself. It's in a later agenda item. Yes, Ms. Johnson, that is correct. Not, not only did we, we calendarize it, but you can also see that we, we up the projections based on the information we have to date. And so you'll see later on that Ms. Eaton will provide the actual submitted governor's uh, recommended budget that includes enrollment projections of 39,000 and 41,000 respectively for fiscal year 2016 and 17. You'll see this 41,646 number as a number we feel very confident in reaching here at the end of this month and moving forward on an average basis to, to meet these projections. Thank you. Ms. Kerr, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, and uh, Mr. Haycock, I have just one question for you. On the average premium for 2015, that $405, did you back the uh, PMP out of that number before you made your calculation, or is it included in, in it? Uh, the average premium includes our $13 per member per month fee, as it is the filed pre is the the average of all of all filed premiums uh, at, that are offered on the exchange. And if if I may, Madam Chair, there's no possible way to have backed out the $13, and the reason is is that not every carrier applies the fees directly dollar for dollar to on-exchange products because per the Affordable Care Act, uh, the products that are offered on the exchange and off the exchange must be equal in price. And whereas there's a per member per month fee associated with on-exchange products, there is not a per member per month fee associated with off-exchange products. So based on the mix and, and market share and, and how a carrier sp splits those plans and, and the utilization and enrollment, uh, the costs have to be equal, and so that $13 is going to be applied differently per each plan, per each carrier, based on how uh, how much they plan on selling off the exchange as well. All right, so then you're charging the 3% on the fee from 2015 as well then, right? You've got 
you've got a compounding calculation going on here. So, so we are showing the net effect of a compound calculation, yes. But no okay. way, no how would we sh would we charge a fee on a fee here at the exchange. We would never recommend that to you all for, for approval. 3% will be 3% and it will not be any more. And so whatever the proposed uh, f the proposed rates are for 2016 will include that 3% fee that we adopt here today if, if, if adopted. And so we are not proposing to charge a, a, a percentage on a flat fee that we've already charged. This is just for comparison's sake that okay. the, current, the, the current premium is X and that 3% of it would equal a flat fee of Y. And so it's, it's simply to put a parameter and to explain what other benefits are available on a straight line basis. So in other words, if I'm a carrier, I'm applying 3% onto my, what I'm going to say, unloaded premium, correct? You would, you would uh, for the record, Damon Haycock, potentially, again, there is that mix of on and off exchange products. And so yes. if, if the desire of an insurance carrier is to, is to sell a $500 plan, three, or, or we'll make it even simpler, a $300 plan is a $9 fee, right? That's 3%. But if that same plan is being offered off the exchange, it will not be offered at, you know, if they're trying to get a $300 plan, uh, the $300 can't be offered off the exchange and $309 on the exchange. So there will be a mix, a proportional basis where our fee will be applied to on-exchange plans, but it may not be the full 3% as they file because they have to have that mix off the exchange as well. So if it was if it was simple, we'd love it. That would be very easy. Whatever we, we adopt, they just add to their plan. But there's a lot more calculations into how, how they build that fee into the plans, not only on the exchange, but how they account for them off as well. Okay, thank you. Ms. Johnstone? Uh, Leslie Johnstone, Damon, I'm still not clear on the impact of this compounding on what you've got as the budget. If we use 504.81 as the average and, and took 3% of that to come up with the total revenue to be generated, are we overestimating the revenue to be generated for purposes of this budget? Uh, that's a very good question, Ms. Johnstone. Damon Haycock, for the re record, uh, at the initial look, it could. It could be an overestimation, but I have a suspicion that when the executive director gives his report and discusses our current enrollment figures, you'll see that we were ultra conservative on 41,000 people. So, so we feel very confident that uh, that the 30, that the 3%, even of 40581 isn't going to compound and over overstate our revenue. Uh, additionally, we will receive uh, more reports from the carriers that and from that were submitted to CMS, and that average premium number will change at the end of February. It'll change at the end of March. It'll change at the end of April, and every month throughout the, this year. And so, so this is a snapshot in time, and our best our best guess. Uh, we we feel confident that this will still provide us the sustainability that we need. Uh, at that 3% of those exact figures. Can, can I, this is Julia, can I make, just, I was just doing some, because I was thinking the same thing, uh, doing some <coughs> like back of the napkin um, calculations, and it looks like it would make, you know, assuming that the full $13, uh, taking the, the full $13 off, it would have potentially up to a $200,000 impact out of $6.2 million <laughs> worth of projected revenue based on the, 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 these conservative enrollment numbers. So, um, from my perspective, I, I would be I would be pretty comfortable moving forward with that. Thank you, Ms. Tesca. I, I was just going to comment that um, I'm happy that you're using the same philosophy you used last year when we were trying to estimate to work hard to come below the uh, federal 3.5 percent. I think that really makes us look good. And based on the figures we were estimated from you last uh, meeting last month, a 52,000 estimate, I think we're going to be fine. Yeah. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, since obviously we're talking about as an estimate based on and dependent upon enrollment as much as it is the average premium, uh, what I will share with you earlier than perhaps I had anticipated is that the most recent indication, of course, from uh, HHS is that we've had over 56,000 people enroll. And based on the information that we have received from our carriers, 
um, uh, who have worked very closely with us and been very kind in terms of providing unofficial information to us. I will tell you that the last number that I received was 51,000 paid. Wow. That's great. Is this medical? That's QHPs. That's not dental. That's good. Do we have any other questions or comments from board members before I open it up to the public? All right, let's open it up to carriers or anyone else that wants to comment or ask questions or input for regulation. You could identify yourself for the record, please. I know you're used to this. You're working up in Carson City a lot right now, too, I'll bet. Actually, my dad would change, so not so much. Up for the record, Jack Kim with United Healthcare. I do have a couple of questions. You know, last year when we came up with the $13 PMPM, it was based on, on a budget. That budget included paying Xerox. And at that time, you know, the decision was made to, to terminate the Xerox contract. And you know, I know there were some discussions at that time was reducing the PMPM. Um, that didn't happen, of course, the great filings had to go in. My question is, the fee itself seems to be very similar, whether it's a percent of premium or a PMPM from last year. And, you know, math is not my strong suit. But, but when I see an equation where one big piece of it is taken out, my question becomes, why is it fee, has, why is it fee nearly identical to last year? And, Mr. Chair, Kim. if I may, yes, Mr. Kim, thank you. Uh, for the record, Bruce Gilbert, Xerox was paid almost exclusively in grant dollars. It was not monies that were within our budget. Uh, and so consequently, that was not an item that you would have seen. Otherwise, our budget last year would have been $17 million or, or more, I believe. So, so, uh, uh, it's, it's not that the, that that is an expense that's no longer in there. It really wasn't factored in whatsoever. A little bit different from what we heard last year. Um, just the other general comment, you know, from our company's standpoint, it's whether it's percent of premium or PMPN, we will, um, we're fine with the other option. But the better concern is just the budget in general. It's, uh, you, know, you talked about comparing this to the uh, FFM, but they do all the back, back room work, and that's why you know, there's a three and a half percent. You know, that piece is not being done here. So you know, our concern is when we see these budgets, we have to build that in not just to our exchange membership, but also to our exchange membership, as was referenced earlier. And at some point, you know, you're asking individuals who aren't in exchange to subsidize everyone else. And you know, there's, there are carriers who are in exchange because they don't want to put that type of additional pressures and premiums on, on the membership. And you know, all carriers think about, about that. Do we, do we want to add another 2 or 3% to our individual policies when we don't have to? And you know, it, it, it's, a, it's something everyone has to go through. But our concern is as we see some of these budgets that the board will take in consideration what they can do in order to keep the budget as low as possible. Otherwise, it can have a negative impact on the entire market, please. Right, Madam Mr. Chair, if, if, I, if I may and, and respond to Mr. Kim, um, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, uh, I, I think it would fa be fair to say that every member of the board recognizes and understands that we need to be able to do our job, but by the same token, we have to be fiscally responsible. I don't think that there's anybody who, who would disagree with that. The point being made that non-exchange members underwrite to some degree the cost of the exchange, that's true across the United States. That's not untrue any place. Um, it's certainly true in the 34 states in which there's an FFM. It's certainly true uh, um, in uh, the District of Columbia, where, in fact, they assess all insurance products, not simply health products, in order to be able to underwrite the cost of their exchange. One of the most pressing uh, issues for exchanges nationwide is sustainability. That is, now that the federal government has said that grants are no longer available, how do you assure that you are able to maintain your operations today and tomorrow and the day after that. Most states have answered it differently than the state of Nevada. Uh, if you take a look at most of the other states, there are either market-wide assessments on all insurance products or market-wide assessments on those products that are both on or off the exchange. 
um, or their monies from the general fund. We don't do any of those things. And so while it is true that uh, uh, the carriers, unfortunately, uh, are required to, to balance out the interests of both those who uh, utilize the exchange and those who do not. Um, I don't think our budget excessive. I have 13 people. We are the smallest exchange in the nation. Rhode Island has 19. I have 13. Um, if you take a look at our budget, two-thirds of it goes to navigators and marketing. I wish I could tell you we're flying to Paris for lunch. We're not. We are doing what we need to do. I think that, that the governor was very fair in looking at our budget request. I requested an additional position, actually, that was turned down. Because that's simply the way it has to be. Um, as I indicated yesterday in the course of, a, of my testimony, uh, uh, at a budget hearing, uh, they asked uh, about, well, if I send five people here or five people there. And the fact of the matter is, I don't have five people to send any place. I just don't. I have an executive assistant who's going to be assisting in the plan management and certification because that's what we need to do in order to get our jobs done. So from my perspective, I don't believe that our budget is excessive. I don't believe that, that it is out of line in any way, shape, or form. Um, I believe that it is probably the smallest budget, aside from Utah, where all they do is the shop plan. It's probably the smallest of any place in the United States that has a state-based exchange. So I think that we are very careful and good stewards of the money. Ms. Seconds, Madam Chair, I, I think um, listening to the conversation, I think this kind of comes full circle back to um, the goals for next year and the year after. We've got some great numbers, but there's tens of thousands of other people who still are not insured. And so, you know, when will we hit 75,000 and when will we hit 100,000? And as those numbers progress, the percentage should be able to come down and the staff, you know, now that the technology part has been fixed, I mean, you just, you would assume that the staff and um, the current budget kind of can be maintained, maintained even as we get larger numbers of people signed up for the exchange and therefore it will cost everybody a little bit less. So I just would love um, also for everyone to think about that too, because it is, yes, the budget and it is the staffing and those issues, but also there is so much more work still to be done. And as long as we can keep those numbers increasing over the next few years, those percentages will all pull down. Just, just a comment. My comments were made to uh, reflect on the number of staff in the exchange. So really just general comments on the budget in total. We see reserve of half a million this year, another projected in the budget, I think another 750000 for next year. You know, you, you start to, to collect quite a bit of a reserve over the next couple of years. And there's other functions that the CARES are slowly taking over, especially this year with the, with the building and everything else. It's, when you look at the budget in total, total, there are things that probably is better left with the CARES because we've done it, we've built in our price. And there are things that exchange that very important things. Um, it, it, I, I guess I bring these comments up as a reminder that you know, when we come up with these numbers, it has a direct impact on the price of the insurance products that we're offering in exchange and also offered off the exchange. And so whatever the board and the exchange can do in order to keep those prices down helps everyone more. If there aren't any other, oh, go ahead, Dr. Jameson. Um, does uh, a couple questions? Does a one percent, like say, three percent versus two percent? Uh, do you think that makes a big difference for your comp competitiveness in the marketplace? A question for our side: We estimated this two sixteen projection on an enrollment of forty one, and we may already have fifty one paid. So it could be as much as twenty percent higher on our side if they were to calculate that. Uh, and does that make a significant difference from the 3%? Uh, how, what, what would that be if it was uh, estimated at 51000 And then does it have to stay, you know, you talked about the, uh, how, how certain states are going to be having to change it from their r r really low and they're going to have to raise it. Does it have to be a steady number throughout the entire year or as we go up in enrollment, can we drop that number? Or it has to be fixed because we go through insurance commissioner and he sets it for the year and it's done deal. 
Okay, so then, then just address the first two questions, I think please. Just one for you and one for the other. On the percentage, you know, I think that's really a uh, competitive issue that really left to the carriers. So, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to answer that question. Every carrier determines what a percentage that they want to add it or not. Um, but what we've seen is over the last few years, as a, as premiums increased by a percentage, you know, we see people drop off. You know, this past year, many people went from a non-ACA compliant product to an ACA compliant product and saw the premiums increase substantially. And as a result, we had seen people say, well, I'm just not going to insurance. I don't qualify for a subsidy. I just can go there without insurance. And you know, the ACA has some very positive things, but it also has resulted in many people having the premiums increase substantially because of the other requirements. As, as the other comment related to can we adjust our pricing because of the exchange fee, we have to file our rates fairly early on, and those rates are the ones we have to use throughout the year. And so we would not be able to really change them you know, on a month to month basis. And uh, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, uh, Dr. Jamison, in response to your, your question um, uh, about uh, the enrollment varying and maybe as much as a 20% change. What I would point out is that it is no secret that right now we do not pay for access to technology. However, I am absolutely certain that ultimately our friends in Washington will come to see us and they will say, you are utilizing our system. There are costs that are attendant to that and we will have to negotiate uh, some sort of an accommodation with them. If you're going to ask me what it would cost, I cannot tell you. I do know that they charge 3.5%, uh, as Mr. Kim said, to do everything. We do almost everything here. The only thing that we really utilize them for are two functions. The first being the platform itself, and the second being their call center to some degree, although we are augmenting that. So I think that we are in a very good and strong position when it comes time to sit down with them. But what I don't want to find us in as far as the situation, is my having to come back before you and say, oh, by the way, um, because we we didn't have enough reserves, we're in a cash crunch, and we're going to have to go from 3% to 3.49%. I don't want to ever have to do that. And so, to some degree, we are building ourselves a buffer for that day when they do come knocking. And we have had unofficial discussions. There's been nothing official about it. But I can guarantee you that the day is coming when we will have to deal with that. That also goes to the question I first asked about your reserves. That's exactly correct. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kim, you might want to stay just for a minute in case we have some other questions for you. But I, I, I want to build on what Dr. Jamison was saying. I don't want to change anything that you're doing budget-wise with the legislature. It's too late to do that anyway. But with respect to your enrollment, Damon, I know you're becoming our whiz kid on, on making changes on things, but if you kick that enrollment up to, say, 45000 or 47500 which is closer to what we're seeing right now, um, what would that change our fee? And there, there's another thing that's happening concurrently with this that, that I want people to remember that I think will drive that enrollment up is that the penalties coming from the IRS to individuals for not having the insurance when we get out another year is almost going to be as much as paying for insurance. So that's going to be a driver of getting more individuals into the exchange as well. So th that's my question and kind of thoughts Right, and uh, Madam Chair, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, uh, I think it's important that we recognize that what I provided to the governor's office, what we provided to the governor's office, is a two-year budget. Mm -hmm. But what we are talking about today is a one-year fee. And we will have the opportunity, when we meet again next year, to raise or lower it depending upon circumstances. The other thing is, we have to operate within the bounds of laws that currently exist, which means that we, have, we will have to talk about those tax penalties. However, we also know that there have been significant sea changes in Washington. And it may or may not be the case a year from now that those penalties continue to exist and drive enrollments. And it's I, I don't think that we can we can overemphasize 
that because I don't think we're in a position to do it. We don't know ultimately what the Affordable Care Act is going to look like in a year. Um, there will be some legislation, there will probably be some vetoes, there'll be a number of things that happen. Um, nonetheless, I think that, that, that because we're dealing with a two-year budget, one-year fee, I think we're in pretty good shape because we can always scale back next year or if we find we're, that enough people drop off over the course of the year, maybe we stay flat, maybe we even have to go up. Um, but it's going to be driven by circumstance, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, and Madam Chair, Damon Haycock, for the record, I'd, I'd like to, to address your, your question and then also provide a missing piece, I think, to, to the, the thought process. Uh, 3% and the dollar figure and the amount of enrollment, there's a missing parameter to this discussion, and that is the average premium. That average premium is at 405.81 today. That doesn't mean it's going to be 405.81 tomorrow. And our initial development of this report starting a, back a week, a week and a half ago, we were using uh, earlier numbers that actually had that premium even higher. And so we're starting to see the trend of the average premium to come down, not necessarily to go up. And again, we're using you know small figures, small, small knowledge of, of a working system. And so we don't have a, enough information to say over the past two years we've experienced X, and so this is our basis for why we want to adopt Y. But what I can tell you is even if we were to take, and, and, and we all agree that the average premium will never increase, and it will be 405.81 for the entire year, and we apply a percentage to it, if you wanted to go up to 47,500 people, you'd drop the percentage down a, a tenth of a point. I mean, you'd go down to 2.9, and that's just what I did on my iPhone. I, I think what's safer, and, I, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Dr. Jamison saying, you know, good job on, on projections. We try to take the most safe and cautious approach to ensuring the sustainability of the exchange. As I said earlier, we're not a, pro a profit organization. No one gets a bonus for bringing in more revenue. And every dollar of revenue that we bring in that we do not have an appropriate expense or, or a reserve requirement to adds to the reduction in fees the next year, which is how you're able to see us go from the $13 per member per month to a snapshot in time down to twelve seventeen. And as Ms. Etkins has said, as more enrollees come in, the, the fees will naturally go down. But if we don't prepare ourselves cautiously, then, then we are gambling on our future. And that is your choice, and, and I'm not telling the board how to, how to act or react. But the difference is so minimal in percentage that, that I, I, we still stand on our 3%. We are that much better than the other folks that we could be if we didn't exist at all. Being a half a point less than the federal government makes us that much better. And if you want, I can do some quick calculations and show you about how much that could save Nevadans for this year. But it's over half a million dollars for sure. And so, so immediately we are making those decisions, as Mr. Kim has mentioned, on trying to lower the cost of insurance across the marketplace, across our, our great state of Nevada. And we feel that this is a huge, huge benefit and a huge decrease in fees to meet that requirement and that vision. Thank you. All right, do we have any other comments you'd like to make, Mr. Kim? Okay. Um, is there anyone in Carson City that would like to testify? We have one coming up now. Hi, for the record, uh, Tracy Woods with Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, one of the carriers. You know, I think for us, we, we have similar concerns, um, as does Mr. Kim. I think your staff has done an amazing job of um, assessing, projecting, um, and really coming, coming up with a solution. I think the piece that I just want to put on the record is that because healthcare.gov um, is it really charging the exchange for a fee, the carriers have had to pick up a bit of the back office stuff that needs to be done. Um, I, you know, I think your staff has come up with an incredible solution to help us get through this and bridge um, whatever CMS may or may not give you in the future, but right now the carriers give the monthly report. Um, there are going to be reconciliation issues, probably both for 2014 and 2015. So just recognizing that, similar to what Mr. Kim said, if you can keep that budget as tight as possible, that I think is where we're coming from. We want, you to, be, we want to be sustainable, we want to participate, um, but just keeping that budget 
you know, as, as tight, if you will, as possible is what we're hopeful for. I mean, we want to be a good partner. We want to continue to be a good partner. And I appreciate um, the executive director's comments and, and definitely the staff, what you've put together and how you've helped us. So just for the record. Thank you, Ms. Wood. Dr. Jameson. Uh, just on our budget, as uh, Mr. Gilbert stated, uh, our biggest part of our budget, of course, is our advertising and uh, uh, navigators. navigators. Thank you. And, uh, and we're seeing a significant drop on the navigator, and we were very concerned about going forward. And so we, as everyone already knows, I think, but just for the record again, are looking at the amount of money we're spending on on our advertising and currently going to be exploring and looking at new bids for that uh, large item in our budget. And the other things such as salary, well, I think we can all recall that our salaries were so minimal, what we offered, that uh, some of our applicants for executive director dropped out because it wasn't enough. And I think we've watched our budget very well and will continue to do so. And I also know next year, if those, Mr. Kim, if those reserves get too high, I know that the board will be fiscally responsible and cut that down because we're not going to allow excessive reserves. So I think we're doing very well. Well, and I'll just add one last comment. When reserves gets too high, I, I seem to recall legislatures reaching and grabbing them <laughs> as well. Yes. 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 So, and, you know, and, that's a tightrope. Yeah. And, and, and actually, uh, Madam Chair, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, uh, we did have a budget hearing yesterday where, where they were very comfortable with 90 days. I think had we gone in there with something more than that, it would have been an issue. But they were questioning groups before us who basically only had 30 or 60 days of reserves, telling them that that's, that was not sufficient from the legislature's viewpoint. So, specific, and particularly in our case where, where we have to generate an invoice, send it out, and wait for carriers to process it and then pay, I think 90 days is appropriate. And, and apparently the legislature did as well yesterday. Do we have any other comments in Carson City? None. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. How about here in uh, Henderson? All right, I'll wrap it up with any other comments from board members, even ex officio members? Okay, let's go ahead and close the workshop. Um, and Dennis, you might help me with this. Just remind our members that we are excluded from 233B, which means we can act on the same day as the workshop and have the regulation be effective and file with the Secretary of State within the next, you know, 24, 48 hours. You want to mm -hmm. just walk through that process sure, quickly sure. so uh, that board sure. members remember that? Uh, the, uh, yes, um, Dennis Belcourt, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, when in the exchange is enabling legislation, uh, there was also a provision exempting it entirely from 233B. That means you do not have to have a workshop on a separate day from an adoption hearing for a regulation. Um, that's what's being done here, and, and so you're within your authority to to go ahead and adopt a regulation and then because uh, the regulation by its terms takes effect for purposes of adopting rates as soon as the board adopts it, then you can go ahead and adopt the, um, the 3% or whatever percentage you choose to adopt in the same meeting without waiting for it to be filed with the Secretary of State. Actually, the requirement for the Secretary of State's office is a, is a 233B requirement. It's not a 695I requirement. And it's not applicable to the exchange. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Belcourt. All right. So we'll go ahead and move to. Got to get on my right page here. We'll move to item number four, which is the adoption of the 2016 per member per month fees to be charged uh, to the insurers. I'll open that uh, for discussion or a mo yeah. motion by board members. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Uh, excuse me. I think you need to actually approve the regulation change and then go ahead with the uh, uh, agenda item four, which would be adopting the rates using the new methodology, the percentage methodology as opposed to the fixed methodology. So under um, 
adopt the regulations, and then you can go ahead and to, to number four and, and actually say we're going to adopt a 3% or whatever percent rate you want to use. Oh, we have to have two separate? I can't combine it on this then. Okay. That's what I was going to do. But Okay, we'll go to 3B then, adoption of, and deliberation, and vote at this time. Madam Chair, this is Leslie Johnstone. I would move adoption of the proposed regulation. Madam Chair, LeBron Lewis, I second the motion. All right, thank you, Ms. Lewis. All right, do we have any further discussion among board members? Okay. All right, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. We have a revised uh, regulation. And then if we move to agenda uh, item number four, we will now adopt the per member per month fee to be charged to the insurers. Madam Chair, on the record, I move adoption of the per member per month fees to be charged to insurers as, as identified in the documents and the discussion that we've had earlier. Okay, and then for the record, that would be 3%, a percentage. 3%, yes. 3 percentage. percentage. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? Both medical and dental. Right, both medical and dental. So is there a second? Lawrence Jameson, Dr. 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 Jameson, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. All right, why don't we take just a few minutes break here? All right, Madam Chair, just uh, for the record, uh, Marie Kerr is left. She is going to be calling in to continue oh, okay. her presence on this, this board meeting. Okay. Marie Kerr's on the phone. Marie Kerr. Oh, thank you, Marie. All right, let's go back on the agenda. And we are at agenda item number five, which is the approval of the minutes from January 15th. And do we have any edits or changes or recommendations to those minutes? If there are none, uh, may I have a motion to approve? Lynn Atkins, so moved. Florence Jamison, second. All right, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And then we go on to the executive director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, it's hard to believe that we first sat together just about six months ago to the day to talk about the exchange, the challenges that it faced, the opportunities that were available to us. The challenges were pretty daunting. We had Xerox wind down and disengagement. You had the upcoming transition to the federal application and enrollment platform. You had a lot of customer and consumer dissatisfaction, class action lawsuits, brokers who were unhappy, agents who were unhappy, um, and an upcoming, probably very critical open enrollment period. So here we are six months down the line. And some of those challenges still remain. You know, the Xerox wind down is continuing, and the litigation filed last year is still out there. However, I think we've been able to see over the past six months some significant successes, particularly in the areas of technology and enrollment. You know, neither consumers nor brokers and agents are experiencing the same type and level of frustrations that boiled over last year and led to headlines. And just with just a few days left in open enrollment, that same broker and agent community has been able to help more Nevadans purchase health coverage than ever before. We believe that CMS will ultimately report that as many as 60,000 Nevadans will have applied for and enrolled in qualified health plans, many of whom are able to afford coverage only because of the premium subsidies that are available through the exchange. On the average, premium tax credits reduce our consumers' monthly premiums by some 67%. Given last year's well-publicized issues and our having to actively re-enroll our entire population, 60,000 is an extraordinary number. And I think it's a testament to the board and my staff that you've gotten where you have. As tempting as it would be to rest on our laurels, ironically, the end of open enrollment brings an even busier time for exchange staff. 
In addition to moving forward on the Xerox front, we're engaged with a number of other ongoing projects. The responses to our marketing RFP have been received and are being scored. We've begun the process of moving plan management and certification activities from the Division of Insurance to the Exchange. The lease for our Consumer Assistance Center is being finalized. Necessary equipment has been worked. Our Navigator RFA has been released. Uh, the mandatory orientation uh, meetings for that have been completed and responses from interested entities are due by the 25th of this month. The legislative session is also going to require our attention over the coming months. I've testified before legislative committees twice already, uh, just in the past week, and I anticipate many additional appearances before the uh, <laughs> session ends. Um, we are, as I indicated previously, also closely following reported discussions about potential federal legislation that might impact either the operation of the exchange or the Nevada marketplace. And we will provide additional information to the board in the future as circumstances dictate. And there's certainly plenty to keep us busy. And I know that we will stay busy as we move through these matters and eventually get to focus on the next open enrollment, which is currently scheduled to take place between October 1st and December 15th of 2015. Uh, one last item. Um, I would be absolutely remiss if I did not note that while there has been great progress over the past six months, most of it is attributable to my staff. General Colin Powell once said, organization doesn't really accomplish anything, plans don't accomplish anything either, theories of management don't matter much. Endeavors succeed or fail because of the people involved. And that's certainly true with respect to the operations of the exchange. From my vantage point, this is as talented a group of people as I have ever had the opportunity to work with. They are knowledgeable, they are competent, they are professional, they are credible and motivated and tireless, and they deserve your appreciation and acknowledgement. Anything good that has happened and any success we have had has been the direct result of their hard work and dedication. And I want to express my personal thanks for their efforts. And that would be some of the substance of my remarks. Except that I would be doubly remiss if I did not acknowledge the contributions of your chair. She has been an extraordinary leader for you, and you were lucky to have her. And I've been lucky to have her as a mentor. And I'm going to miss you a lot. Told you, I'm only an email away. <laughs> That's what you say now. <laughs> Do we have any questions from board members to Mr. Gilbert with respect to his report? Any from you, Marie? Rich, no, she's on mute. That was very thank you for that. We will with you, Barbara. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to make a, a change here on the agenda item, and I would like to move to the election for the chair and vice chair per statute uh, NRS uh, 695I.320. And before we go to that election, there are a few comments that I would like to make. I know that I told you last month that I would not stand uh, for re-election as chair this year, but I want to tell you that I also advise the governor that I would be retiring from the board once we elect a new chair and a vice chair. This is gonna be a very exciting year for me as I've been working on a merger for my company in the last six months and we'll be releasing a press release in the next couple of weeks. And I wanna put my full attention to this new venture and this is a good time for me to do that. Over the last year, with the help of our many partners, we've transitioned our exchange into a supported state-based exchange and I can't begin to appropriately thank everyone who assisted us in this successful transition. Starting with Steve Fisher, who helped us bridge the gap between executive directors and then went on to manage the implementation at Health and Human Services. Scott Kipper and your team at Division of Insurance have guided us through the insurance rules and regulations. And Romain Gillian at Health and Human Services and your fantastic group. You actually bore the brunt of the burden of the change and you made it happen successfully. Julia Tesca gave us all the IT support with Dave Gunderson leading, uh, leading that function. Dennis Belcourt and his team at the Attorney General's office 
helps us on a daily basis and continues to guide us in the termination and wind down of the Xerox contract. Here at the exchange, our staff shifted gears and immediately tasked and linking to the federal infrastructure. It meant letting go of our initial plans and quickly focusing on a successful uh, second enrollment period. Damon, Laura, Carrie, and Tyler, and the rest of our wonderful staff have met that challenge. I can't forget our carriers, our brokers, and navigator groups who struggled so hard last year and tell me today it's a dream compared to last year. Thank you for sticking with us. To my fellow board members and especially to Lynn Atkins, thank you for all your hard work, advice, and support. Lastly, to our new executive director, Bruce Gilbert, thank you for accepting our offer, and thank you for moving your family here to Nevada. You've given the exchange a new vision with your vast level of experience in the state government and in the insurance industries. That level of positive and mature management is paying off. I've seen your staff mature in the struggle and smile at their success. When closing my meeting with the governor, I told him I had not been working with the typical stereotypical uh, slate of government workers. I've been working with real entrepreneurs who have worked in a short time frame with multiple partners and they have succeeded. We set a goal of 60,000 enrollees for this second enrollment period. And at the end of January, the feds reported to us that we may have reached our mark of 56,000. I hope in the next reporting we break through our goal. As said earlier, this is a good time and a good place for me to think of retirement from the board. I'm excited about my new business venture and I'm feeling like I'm really leaving you all in a good place. But before I call for the election of Leslie Johnstone as our chair and Marie Kerr as our vice chair, you're on the phone there, Marie. <laughs> I'd like to ask Lynn Atkins to say a few comments. Thank you. Um, so I think as, some, as many of you know, I have um, accepted a job uh, opportunity in Los Angeles. And so my husband and I are moving back to Los Angeles um, next month. So I too am stepping down from the board and it has been quite a ride and incredibly exciting. And I really feel blessed and honored to have initially been appointed um, by Speaker um, Osagera and then again by Speaker Kirkpatrick um, for the consumer position. And um, I hope um, I, I hope that the work that our subcommittee and this board has done um, was helpful to Nevada consumers. I think it was. Um, and it's just been a pleasure. And um, I have loved working with everyone on the board here. Um, obviously watching Barbara um, carry much of the load, but working with everyone here and, and becoming friends with everyone here has just been lovely. And um, I will miss everyone, but um, I'm excited for my new opportunity as well. And um, no, we have left you all in very good hands and you will all prosper without us. So <laughs> that's my that's my news. Thank you. And so I thank you. It's a different blue bag, but it is a blue bag <laughs> from the board members. Aww, thank you. <laughs> Appreciation nice. for your service thank and leadership you. on the consumer action is in particular. Oh, so now, as, yeah. As upcoming chair, uh, Ms. Johnstone, I, I think, has shared the secret that we carried for the last month. <laughs> so <laughs> you've been out running around. <laughs> thank you. Aww, thank you, everyone. Well, as with Barbara, it's the least we could do. So appreciate it. <laughs> nice box. Okay, that is gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. So I don't know if the others can Ooh. see, but there's a, a bent. Uh, ear on the side, <laughs> and the story is: this is a chap turning a chapter, <gasps> oh. a page in the chapter of your life. <laughs> oh. Okay, that is. Oh, you know, that's the <laughs> sales lady had me in that. <laughs> that is. Thank you so much. I mean, seriously, this is, this has just been quite a ride, and I'm so glad and have gotten to know all of you. So thank you. I will. I will put this in my office. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, it's a new chapter. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, so, members, 
we are now at the point. We have a slate, uh, and the slate is Leslie Johnstone is chair, and uh, Marie Kurt is vice chair. So unless there are any other nominees, I would call for a motion. Move the adoption. Madam Chair, I move it. Juan Lewis, for the record, I move the adoption of the slate of offices for the Civil State Health of Change. Ms. Dr. Ford, I second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion in the second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Yay. 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 <laughs> You get to chair me. No, no. I'm not chairman anymore. You get to chair me. <laughs> I don't You're think sure this is a Leslie's <laughs> like, no one told me about this. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Marie. She's on mute again. <laughs> All right. Well, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we will take up item number seven on the marketing and outreach report. All right. Madam Chair, new Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you. Tyler Klein is for the record, communications officer. So I was asked, um, just because of the, the nature of this agenda, to not, well, KPS3, you'll notice, is, is here, and they're, they're able to answer any questions, but I'm going to give the report today. We're not going to focus so much on the numbers and the metrics, which you've seen. Uh, we'll, of course, report on those at the, at the close, um, which is Sunday. Hard to believe uh, it is upon us. So I'm going to go through just a couple things really focus on the big day, um, February 15th. So we've been uh, very aggressive during the last month of the campaign. Um, in addition to the original statewide media campaign and outreach and distribution program, which of course, we've exceeded the goals, we continue to do so uh, as far as metrics go. We've, um, uh, there's been some additional tactics that have been implemented to ensure we're doing everything possible to reach Nevadans uh, before the close of the open enrollment period. So I'm going to go through a few of those. Uh, utilizing social media, which we discussed the last couple meetings, actually. Um, Facebook and Twitter ads uh, are running now through February 15th. Uh, they contain clear messaging about the deadline and how to sign up. I've seen them on my, my Twitter feed. I, I, I'm not sure if you have. But uh, January 29th was also National Youth Enrollment Day. Uh, we were able to participate in that with um, social media ads. They created a... Uh, a campaign, uh, a hashtag that we joined in on, and, and that was just something else that, that we were able to partner with the feds and, 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 and states across the nation. Um, by the numbers, uh, we, and I believe, Madam Chair, you, you mentioned that before we started the meeting, uh, it's, it's a new ad, uh, it's, it's, it's animated, so I'm not sure if you've seen it, but it's gone up on our social media platforms, we've run it on broadcast, and it's been great. It's, it's, it's a great way to supplement uh, our current marketing. And obviously, it's aimed towards the young invincibles who historically wait till the last minute to enroll. So I think it's been a, a, a great addition to our overall campaign. Now, uh, with the original ad campaign that, that continues to run, we've added now banners onto the commercials. If you look closely, uh, that have February 15th deadline on there. So there's a little bit uh, a little bit of difference with, with those ads. We also have countdowns in the digital campaign, 10 days to enroll, nine days to enroll, eight days left, and that will continue until Sunday as well. Driving traffic to the stores, uh, we put additional billboards in the same neighborhood as the Boulevard Mall to call out the Boulevard Mall um, to make sure people know that they can go there. It's a place that they can sit down, talk to professionals, and sign up. I wanted to uh, just add something to this. We received a email from Roger McClellan over at the Legislative Council Bureau. He received a call, I'm not sure how and, and through which avenues, but it was a couple who uh, were very confused about the process. They had um, some issues. They didn't understand really what plans they were in, what plans they should go in, and they were obviously very worried about this. <laughs> it came from Roger to our office. Uh, we were able to uh, talk to them, uh, and then we, we came to the conclusion that the, the best thing for, for this couple, and they're an elderly couple, uh, was to go to the enrollment store where they could actually sit down and talk to somebody face to face. They went that day, that night. The next day they called um, not only 
uh, Roger, what they call our office, to, to say, and the enrollment store manager, uh, to say how thrilled they were. Uh, they were near tears. They were very excited. And I think that just goes to um, what the enrollment stores do for us, what this extra outreach does for the consumers. And at the end of the day, what face-to-face -face interaction, a place where you can go in for free and sit down, talk to somebody, what that, that does. So, you know, a hat tip to, to KPS3, their staff, the management there, um, brought those people in, sat them down. And then, of course, to the assisters, brokers, and agents who, who helped them. So I wanted to add that. Um, we've done a few extra uh, one-off enrollment events since the last time we met. Uh, one was at the Durango Community Center. Another was at the Pearson Community Center. And the NAACP actually reached out to us and said, hey, we'd love to do a little event um, at, at the Pearson Community Center. They said, well, we'll get the word out, but we don't have computers. We have no way to enroll people. So we had our sisters go there. Uh, I believe it was four or five hours, and uh, we had an event, and it was it was successful, and just other ways that we're getting out in the community and trying to hit every corner of the community, giving everybody an opportunity to to enroll. Sunday, uh, February fifteenth is is the big day. Um, I know you saw the the press release that that went out. Um, our enrollment stores, we absolutely expect them to be quite busy. Uh, in the Vegas store alone, Tuesday we saw 187 people walk in, which is, is quite the uptick. Yesterday we saw over 200. Um, and that's on a Tuesday and Wednesday. So, so we should expect, and, and we do, and we're, and, and we're prepared for a very, very busy uh, weekend, which is great news. Um, in addition to both enrollment stores, down south there's going to be the Get Healthy, Get Covered Health and Enrollment Fair. Um, this is going to be at the Cox Pavilion for UNLV. Um, the Ramirez Group is hosting this event, much like opening weekend of open enrollment. Um, and we're going to have over 100 enrollment assisters there. There's going to be a health fair component, immunizations, health screenings, health checks. It's going to be very kid-friendly. It'll be open from 11 to 7. And uh, that's been out to the media. It's already been covered, both Spanish language and English language media. So, uh, it, you know, they're both kind of close to each other. Enrollment store at the Boulevard and UNLV, which is, is really going to help for the weekend. Um, we expect to be all over the place. Um, we're, we're able to move resources one place or the other um, if we see a, a, a peak or, or an increase at one of the locations. So it's going to be a great weekend, and I think we're uh, well prepared to receive uh, anyone and everyone who comes out. So uh, in Reno, of course, we have the enrollment store and then the Ramirez Group office we're utilizing for overflow which is very uh, close to our enrollment store as well. So um, all of the activities have been heavily promoted, uh, TV and radio, press releases, media interviews, and uh, of course all the person-to-person -to -person touch points leading up. So with that, uh, I'll entertain any questions, but that's all I have. Bravo. <laughs> all sounds very, very good. Um, next item is number eight, monthly budget projections. Thank you, Carrie Eaton, for the record. Uh, there have been no significant changes to the budget for fiscal year 2015. The exchange has expended and projected approximately 71% of, of the available budget as of, as of last week. The general fund advanced in the amount of $750,000 was returned to the general fund by a work program that was approved in January. For the 2016-2017 budget, the governor's recommended budget, as you all know, is no longer confidential, and the summary of the exchange budget is provided on page three of this report. The exchange did have our first budget hearing yesterday in front of the Joint Subcommittee on General Government, which I believe was addressed earlier in this meeting. So to briefly go over the exchange's 2016 and 2017 budget, the total projected revenue is approximately $6.2 million for 2016 and $6.5 million for 2017. The expenditures for the exchange include just over $1.2 million each year in salaries. The operating category will cost the exchange just over $2.5 million each year and includes funding for a marketing and outreach program. 
Additionally, the exchange has budgeted $2.2 million each year to continue to meet uh, the federal requirement and to provide our navigator and assisters, uh, navigators, excuse me. Uh, so in total, the exchange's budget for both years of the biennium is just under $6.2 million. And again, that's our goal to keep a 90-day reserve. And I would be happy to address any questions. Any questions in the evening? I would have one. I like yes. to Madam Chair. Um, Barbara Smith Campbell, for the record. Um, the salaries dropped for fiscal year 2017. Can you explain that? Yes, I can. In 2017, there is one less day. I believe 2016 is a leap year. And so that accounts for the drop in salary. It's one day. Okay. It's cute. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Carrie, this is Leslie Johnstone. I have a question. Can you walk us through the cash reserve section? What these are not cumulative numbers, they go from one to the next based upon time point in time? Correct. Uh, Carrie Eaton. For fiscal year twenty fourteen, we carried forward a total of five hundred and twenty-four thousand eight hundred and forty-nine dollars. And so our estimated fifteen reserves are at seven hundred and eighty eight thousand three ninety eight. And then for our 2016 and 2017 budget, we add those in accordingly. So at the end of 2016, adding the 19,559 to our 16 or 15 and 14 reserves, we should have 1.3 million, which would be a 79-day reserve. And then adding 380,000 in uh, 2017 would take us up to 1.7 million, which would be a 101-day reserve. But of course, 2017. Two years away, that could change depending on our enrollments and, and how fees are set. Thank you. Uh, right. for, for the record, this is this is Damon Haycock. Just real quick, I want to I want to dovetail off of what Miss Eaton said, and I think this is a great opportunity to illustrate what we do when we receive reserves and how we're able to reduce fees accordingly. As you can tell, we need approximately, you know, between 1.3 and 1.7 million dollars in reserves, but we're only looking at achieving 19,000 by itself in fiscal year 16, and only 380,000 by itself in 17. So, so as we are to, to, to remain fiscally sustainable, we also need to be prudent with with these dollars. And so, uh, the, with the fee structure and how we set them every year. Uh, we have no intention of growing a massive uh, reserve. Uh, we basically, as I believe the, the first executive director said back when this was first set up, we will bleed off reserves as we get them to ensure that we keep it at a healthy and appropriate rate while still reducing cost to Nevada. And so I just wanted to add that in here. To, to This is a great illustration as to how we manipulate, I won't say manipulate, but how we utilize reserves appropriately to keep costs down. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to item nine, the status of the Xerox closeout. So for the record, Damon Haycock, and, and this lovely item falls on me to start. So, uh, the purpose of this report, of course, is to provide the board and the public with an update on where we're at with Xerox. And previously, we tried to, to separate this process into a technical closeout and, and partition off the, the, the ever so pleasant experience of reconciliation. And so what, we've, what we're doing in this report and all reports moving forward is, is we're going to combine this all into one report, one update. This is all surrounding 2014 enrollment uh, processes, issues, and of course the closeout of the Xerox contract itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start and discuss parts of this report. I will be handing this off to our director briefly to, to give an overview over, over how he's changed. I don't want to say changed, but how he's intensified the vision of how he's meeting the reconciliation efforts. And then uh, he'll pass it off to, to Ms. Rich to finish. But basically, we have uh, those same factors that were reported on last month to start this report. The the boss decommissioning, and that's our, our basic disconnection between ourselves and the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. And that process is still on track. We do have meetings every week or two just to reaffirm that we have the appropriate dates, times, and requirements so we can unhook from the eligibility engine that ho hosted over there at uh, Welfare. And so, uh, of course, there are 
are potential decommissioning activities that, that haven't been finalized yet, and, and they aren't finalized because of data reconciliation efforts. So you're going to hear that moving forward as we continue through this report. A lot of things hinge and are, and are, are rippled off of that reconciliation effort. As far as data retention, so we've received official decommissioning guidance from CMS, which is very helpful. And we have uh, gone back and looked at all of our preliminary planning processes and ensured that each item and each task that we have developed is either in accordance with that decommissioning guidance or on top of utilizing industry best practices. So not only are we looking at just checking the box to meet the requirements of, of the federal government, uh, if there's a, an additional process that can make this easier or better or, or safer, we will incorporate that into our data retention uh, as an addition to, to what, is, what is specifically necessary so we ensure we can safeguard Nevada's information for the entire 10-year data retention schedule. Uh, we have also um, managed to, to work out an, an initial agreement with EATS, the Enterprise IT Services, our, our, our IT division, uh, to host that data. And so we are in the process of working with them and with, of course, Den Dennis Belcourt from the district, uh, district attorney's office. I about gave you a different title. The deputy attorney general's office uh, to, to finalize that agreement to ensure we have a solid and concrete method to retain our data no matter who is here over the next 10 years. And so it is, it is very near and dear to, to us to ensure that we set up this process for the future. Uh, and ensure that we can hold this data appropriately. Additionally, our contractors in, uh, with Natoma are developing applications so we can access that data, both for 1095A form corrections and, and, and the associated IRS reporting, but also with uh, data requests that may occur from our federal partners, the IRS, CMS, as well as any potential uh, and current litigation that we may have to face. And so thinking ahead, and being proactive, we're ensuring that we have a system that can uh, access data and query what is necessary to meet the requirements both today and the future. Uh, additionally, don't for, uh, please don't forget that consumers through the Affordable Care Act have a, the ability to request their information and we need to adhere to that. And so that is also being built into these applications. Moving forward on to the call center closeout, uh, the current plan, of course, is for the Xerox call center to shut down services on March 31st, 2015. And thanks to your approval last month over the concept of our consumer assistance center, we are moving ahead, as Director Gilbert mentioned in his executive director report, of standing that up to seamlessly transition that 18557NV link number from the Henderson uh, uh, call center to our consumer assistance center here in Carson City. And so our plan is to, is to provide no break in service or coverage or assistance to Nevadans as we continue to navigate through 2015. Uh, the, next, the next topic, of course, is case reconciliation. And, and as, I, as I included at the beginning of this report, I'm going to turn this over to Director Gilbert to, to really, really pound home his, his vision on this process. Thank you, Mr. Haycock. Madam Chair, members of the board, Bruce Gilbert for the record. You guys have had to live with this a lot longer than I have, okay? And I guarantee you, your frustration is probably the equal of, or maybe even a little greater than mine, when we talk about this particular topic. For a number of months, prior to my coming and even after my coming, we were attacking the, I'm just going to call it the Xerox problem, because any portion of their operations I refer to as problem. We're attacking the problem in buckets. Okay, we had a bucket of consumer complaints, we had a bucket of financial issues, and we had a bucket of other stuff, apparently. Um, and when I came and I took a look at things, you know, we were working on consumer cases, which I understand, because they would be the most pressing. You know, a case was opened when a consumer called or a constituent contacted uh, a legislator's office. So obviously those things are on fire and you have to attend to them. So that was the first bucket being, being considered. But we became a sequential organization in terms of our approach to problem solving, which is we're gonna deal with this bucket 
And then when we're finished with this bucket, we're going to look at the other buckets and we're going to decide which bucket we're, we're going to work on. And we're going to work these things through in buckets. You know, there's a real problem with that from my perspective, and that is pace. You cannot resolve a fairly significant number of problems quickly if you are going to move through them bucket by bucket by bucket. And so when I came aboard some six months ago, one of the things that I told you was, I'm going to <laughs> provide additional resources to help us move this project along. And, and of course, uh, uh, Rosa and Yvonne joined us and they were working specifically uh, on that. But we just weren't getting as far as fast as I thought perhaps we should. And so what I indicated to the board the last time we sat down was, now that open enrollment is sort of taken care of, I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to this personally. We're going to see if we can't come up with perhaps a better solution than we've had to this point in time. Um, I thought it important that we understand the global universe of problems. It's nice to be able to put things in buckets, but it is more important, I think, to understand exactly everything that is out there and how are we going to push through it all, not how are we going to get through this bucket or that bucket. How are we going to push through it all and when are we going to push through it all? And accordingly, since I did not want to deal with this piecemeal, um, I requested that we add four additional resources from PCG Boston. I said I want one task to each carrier. And what we don't want to do is start with Xerox data and take it to the carriers, because we know that's wrong. Let's start with carrier data and see what they believe that the problems are, and then start walking it backward. Um, we did secure four additional resources. It was in our, it was within the bounds of our current contract, so it's not costing us any more money uh, than we had initially anticipated. But we wanted to get it done. And we want to get it done right. And I spent some time on the phone with PCG, forceful time, and I believe that they understand very well what my expectations are. Um, the carriers have been understanding, and they're on board. They recognize the importance of trying to move these problems forward, all of them, not pieces or parts, but all of them. Uh, PCG is on board. We're having weekly conferences with them. I get a report every single week that identifies where we are in the process, how we're moving forward, where the risks are, you know, what's red, what's green, what's yellow, just like we did uh, to get uh, uh, hooked up to the federal exchange. So we're utilizing that exact same process. Uh, we have staff on board. Uh, 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 Ms. Rich, for better or worse, has inherited this particular uh, uh, project um, uh, primarily because she's been working with the carriers to this point in time. And it made a lot of sense from my perspective to have somebody who has a good relationship with the carriers and has been working with PCG involved in, in running this particular show. So I have staff on board, I have PCG on board, I have carriers on board. No, I don't know that I got Xerox on board. <laughs> um, so what I, what, I, what I will share with you is something that, that you are all, you all, you already know before I tell you, okay? We're bringing as, mo as many resources to bear as is humanly possible um, to deal with all of these issues. How quickly I'm going to be able to do it, I don't know. One of the things that, that I will do, though, is I'm not going to give you nonsensical numbers anymore. Okay, I'm not going to pretend that we have 453 unhappy people out there and that's my universe of issues, because it's not. For all I know, I've got a million. It's somewhere between zero and infinity, but I have no idea how many. And what the first charge to PCG is, help us get our arms around just how messed up this is. And with that, Ms. Rich, I think I will turn it over to you. <laughs> Laura Rich, for the record. Uh, it sounds like Mr. Gilbert covered uh, most of what I was going to say, but um, just, to, just to recap, uh, we have brought PCG Boston on board. They are in the initial discovery phase uh, doing their uh, initial analysis of what's, what's remaining out there. So they originally tackled what was the, the caseload of uh, those were those were people that called in. Those were the carriers that called in on the members' behalf. Um, these were these were uh, calls that were uh, tagged as 
consumer complaints or concerns, they have gotten through the majority of those. So now the next step is really to uncover what the universe of issues are. Um, what remains out there that is not that's not known at this point. So what they're doing is really reconciling what with what the carriers have and what Xerox has and coming to a consensus as to what is correct and and uh, you know reconciling between those two uh, and coming to a, uh, a, a some sort of agreement um, per se. So that's that's the first part. Uh, the second part is going to be also reconciling per member per month fees. Um, at this point, until we get through all that, we do not, we're unable to reconcile with Xerox as far as what the per member per month fees were um, and, and what is owed. So that will be the, uh, the last part of that project. Um, additionally, I'll, I'll move on to the 1095 since the reconciliations also affect the 1095s. So on January 30th, the 1095A forms were mailed out. And this was based on data that was current as of January 21st. So any change, any fix, any, you know, if someone called in and said, um, you know, my, my effective date was not right or my termination date is wrong, and that was corrected on January 22nd, that will not be included in that 1095. So anything that, uh, any reconciliation that occurs after January 21st will require a revised 1095A form. And there are currently three dates that are scheduled for revised 1095A forms to go out, the next one being February 25th. Um, additionally, once Xerox departs, uh, there is, as Mr. Haycock mentioned, a data retention plan that includes the exchange acquiring the ability to manipulate the 1095A data and reproducing those 1095A forms or corrected forms. Um, so this mechanism is currently being developed and will have to undergo testing before it is implemented and used by the exchange. So that is all I have. I think Mr. Gilbert covered most of it, but I will take any questions that you have. Sure. Yes, Ms. Campbell. <laughs> Barbara Smith Campbell, for the record. Um, I have two questions for you, if I might. Um, our initial budget with PCG Boston, I think, was for three months. Um, <laughs> what are you doing as far as budgeting for the additional time and how are we going to pay for that? And then my last question is, and it's a question that came from the broker group that I met with earlier this morning, and that is, how do, who do they contact if there are questions about the 1095 A's? They need some direction and guidance when they think that there needs to be a correction or something's amiss with it. So those are my two questions. Okay, so Laura Rich, for the record, um, the answer to your first question is that uh, we are there are no additional funds going into uh, the 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 initial or the current PCG uh, contract. We we really just expanded their scope, um, but it, it's just an, an amended work order, so there are no additional funds going into that. And the answer to your second question is. Through March 31st, they will need to reach out to the Xerox call center, and the call center reps there are uh, equipped to answer the 1095A questions if it is for some reason incorrect or there needs to be an address change or they need a, uh, a duplicate form mailed out. The CSRs are uh, able to either... Uh, tag it with a, a correction that is needed or uh, request a, a new mailing of that 1095, so a duplicate mailing. Um, so they're, they're able to do that through March 31st. If I might follow up with that to both questions, isn't PCG Boston continuing to do the work for the carriers, the reconciliation? I mean, there has to be manpower and labor and cost associated with that 
uh, maybe a work order authorizes it, but it's going to cost money. Right. So, so this is being, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilbert, if you want to. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to you, Mr. Haycock. So, so thank you, Damon Haycock, for the record. Uh, PCG Boston <laughs> was was initially contracted to perform the reconciliation effort, and it was by uh, initial design that partitioned that effort into into working, as Mr. Gilbert mentioned, bucket by bucket or or parts of of problems instead of the problems as a whole. So I think a good term to use is they have been repurposed within the initial scope of what they were hired to do. So, so we've, whereas, whereas Director Gilbert has added resources, uh, it is not necessarily adding a bunch of contract staff that meets that resource addition. Uh, and, and so, so what we were paying them to do before, we're, we're actually paying them to do now, and then we've added additional work to them. Uh, to to manage the entire world of issues, uh, as a just a, a quick brief example, if a Nevadan has a problem, they may have a problem with their enrollment date, they may have a problem with their termination date, they may have a problem with their with their APTC allocation, and they may have a problem with the fact that we've pulled funding from their automatic withdrawal from their bank after they've terminated. And so instead of working a problem where we only fix the enrollment date first. And then we work on the termination date second, and then we decide, oops, we 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 messed up and, and allowed Xerox to pull your money for two additional months. Now we got to come back and fix the 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 financial part of it. We're not we're no longer partitioning these problems for Nevadans. We're trying to fix them all for that Nevadan at the same time, and, and therefore we can truly close out the process on a human being level. But uh, if I didn't quite cover that to your satisfaction, I'm sure Director Gilbert can add some more. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Haycock. Uh, for the record, Bruce Gilbert. The initial uh, agreement or contract with PCG Boston was for three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That was subsequently raised for to seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. However, those are uh, my recollection, and Ms. Eaton, you can correct me if I am incorrect. My recollection is that this is actually paid through federal grant monies that are available for this purpose. Am I correct in that? You are correct. That was my question. That's what I thought. That so so the, the answer is this is a continuation of federal grant monies that are paying for it under the DD&I portion of the contract as opposed to M&O. Okay. Not that I understand any of that, but that's what I'm given to understand. Okay. As of <laughs> April 1st, when Xerox goes away, who, who do consumers contact if there are problems with the 1095A? When they start doing their taxes on April 2nd and then right. they don't look at it until then. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and for the record, or Bruce, Bruce yeah. Gilbert, uh, <laughs> for the record, Bruce Gilbert, as indicated uh, by Mr. Haycock, we anticipate there being essentially a uh, no failure in service between the time that Xerox closes its doors and the group in Carson City begins to accept calls. So what will happen is they will continue to call the same number, which is our Nevada Health Lake number. However, instead of coming down here to Henderson and, and dealing with people across the hall, they will be dealing with folks in our office, or I, what I should say is people under our supervision. Okay, so the message to the public is they call that 1-800 or our Health Link number, and invisibly they will be directed to the right area. Th that is correct. Right. Uh, again, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, we find ourselves in a difficult situation because obviously we can't provide tax advice. But what we can do is be a conduit and say, tell me what type of problem you're having so that if the issue is an incorrect 1095, we can deal with it one way. And if the issue is, well, I don't know what to do now, uh, we have been in touch with our federal partners who are offering basically free tax services to those who earn under a certain amount, um, or we will tell them to deal with their, their health their health professional. I've been doing this too long. Right. Uh, they're, they're tax preparer and professional. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Atkins. Uh, Lynn Atkins, for the record. So just following up with the 1095, though. So if a consumer calls um, April 5th, they get directed to the Carson City staff. They say there's an error in my 1095. Is something set up that the Carson City staff is going to be able to have Xerox reissue an appropriate one? Or, I mean, just because some, how's that going to work? Uh, for the record, <laughs> Bruce, Bruce Gilbert, actually, that is Mr. Haycock's headache. 
He has been tasked specifically with making sure that we have a process in place. We're currently negotiating that even as we speak. So we are, we are aware of the potential for, for an issue or problem. And uh, Mr. Haycock has been tasked with that. Would that be a correct statement, Mr. Haycock? Uh, unfortunately for myself, no, Director Gilbert. <laughs> So, 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 Damon Hager, for the record, let me let me uh, attempt to provide you with peace of mind, even though I, I cannot confidently tell you that you should have peace of mind. Okay, so, so currently we are in the process of negotiating with Xerox, and as you all have experienced over the last two years, the success that we've had with Xerox, if it is any indicator, then you truly should feel sympathy for the situation that I find myself in. <laughs> And, and so, and, and so, I want to make did. sure that, that I am completely above board and transparent. That everything humanly that my team can can accomplish, we are doing. And there is no no stick large enough. There is no no whip that cracks loud enough that we are not attempting to utilize and bring forth every resource to bear <laughs> to ensure that that we have access an appropriate methodology to continue to assist Nevadans. And to be frank, to assist them even better than they're being assisted now. However, we still have to finalize the closeout negotiations with Xerox, and and, and as part of those, until that is fi until it's completely final, I'm sure you're well aware that we can't go into it. But it is one of the things that I am championing is how we deal with that data and all of the ripples that occur because of it, to include specifically this 1095A reissue and correction window process. And so, so if, if I appear tired and I'm not sleeping, this is the exact reason why. <laughs> and, and, I, and I promise you that, uh, that if there is a way to do it, we will find it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, that brings us to item 11, discussion and possible action on dates, times, and agenda items for future meetings. Uh, for one, I would like to ask that we have an item to talk specifically about the post-March 31st plan, um, in particular how consumers will interact with us on their issues and how we will let them know that. Any other items? You know, the only one that I know of, that just because I've been dealing with the AG's office on some of this, is that the, the transfer of that data information is a really critical component to the, the closeout to Xerox, and probably be good for the board to have a little more detail on what's going on with that. Um, you guys probably know this already, but um, Will and then Wen would be uh, new board members. Will they come along to, or will there be no further board members? Um, typically, what happens is the appointing authority. Mm -hmm. So we have two different appointing authorities for the vacancies. Uh, we'll start to receive um, volunteers and/or right. nominations, and then they'll. Uh, Act accordingly. There isn't a particular schedule for them to fill the slots. There is an office within the governor's office that takes care of the gubernatorial appointees, and I am a gubernatorial appointee. So, if someone has an interest in it, I would go through the governor's office and submit a resume and, and letter of interest. Um, Ms. Atkins went through the assembly. So you'd be speaking with the speaker or the uh, majority leader. No, I'm the speaker of the assembly. Yeah, speaker of the assembly. So um, have we notified those people that the, these positions are open? We've sent resignation letters. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. they read people. And, and for the record, yeah. Bruce Gilbert, I've actually reached out um, to, uh, to to the speaker's office and, and others to let them know about this and then. We're going to be looking for yeah. additional board members. And typically that doesn't happen quickly. Mm -hmm. So it would really be important that Bruce gets four members here so to keep the quorum. quorum. Yeah. What is a quorum with? Four. 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 will remain four. So remember the telephone ability if you have four or something. Six. So there's, oh, so we have Wait, six. I mean, you have, there's we seven. Have, four, seven five, we have five, we have five, five left. Five. I need four five must attend. Four yeah. must attend. Yeah. Yeah. 
that. So we can always call it. Right? Yes, you may always call it. So for that yeah, other reason, we won't here. change the scheduled times mm -hmm. um, until we get full up. So it hopefully it will be easier to have the attendance. This Dr. Ford, for the record, uh, will there be legislative updates as we had two years ago no. that were so wonderful to sit through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bruce Gilbert, for the record, it doesn't sound like you'd like them, frankly. I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact is there's probably a minimal amount of legislation that you'll be looking at this year right. that's going to affect the, the uh, exchange and our operations. If, as, and when those those come forward, they will certainly be reported to the board. Will they be reported in the meetings, or will there be additional meetings? Um, I would um, like them included in the standing meeting. Thank you. So, as would I. That's easy. All right. Any other items for future agendas? Then uh, we'll move on to public comment. Any public comment in Carson City? No, no, Madam Chair. Thank you. How about Henderson? Seeing none, uh, we are adjourned. Great. Right. Casting of the invisible gavel. <laughs> the casting of the invisible gavel.